Hello everyone, welcome to this wonderful event by organized by the Emergency Committee Rojava. And um, I'll just say a word about Rojava and I'm pretty sure you already know Debbie Bokchin and David Graber, um, but I'll introduce them briefly and I'll let you listen to them. First of all, I want to apologize for the small room. It was last minute, we did our best. And thank you so much for coming, those of you standing. If you want to just sit in the front on the floors, that's perfectly fine. Let's make it communal, let's make it Kurdish style, <laughs> and just enjoy each other's close company. So Emergency Rojava Committee was formed in 2018, when Afrin was occupied by the Turkish state. And we... The mission at the time was to call attention to the occupation of Afrin and to stop the displacement of people of Afrin and the economic exploitation of their resources, which is still ongoing. Uh, the mission of Emergency Committee Rojava is to uh, defend Rojava, to make sure it's a valid, legitimate political actor, as it should be and to popularize its political ideas here in the U.S. and globally, and also campaign against U.S. complicity in Turkey's war on Kurds, and urge the resumption of peace negotiations between the Turkish state and Kurds today, especially um, under these dire circumstances of the rising Turkish authoritarianism, uh, we know just this past week that the Mothers of Peace were beaten up. We know that just this past week um, that the opposition leader, who's just a social democrat, has been beaten up and thousands are in jail and thousands have been fired from their jobs and thousands are on hunger strike today. So um, a government who is doing this to its own population is obviously a threat to Rojava as it was to Afrin as it occupied Afrin. So those are our missions, and please uh, be connected with us, support us in any way that you can. Um, so that is Emergency Committee Rojava. And today we're here to discuss what will happen to Rojava now that the ISIS has been defeated, and now that the US has um, trying to pull its troops off the region, and how will this affect um, the precarious situation of the Kurds and others who are living in this democratic confederalism. And so, um, uh, Debbie Bukchin and David Graber are here to discuss these questions with us. Debbie Bukchin is a longtime journalist and author. She has reported for a variety of publications, including the New York Times, the Atlantic, the Boston Globe, the New York Review of Books. She served for three years as press secretary to US Congressman Bernie Sanders when he was first assumed office in 1991. Bookchin was born and raised in New York City, the daughter of two activist parents. Her father is the philosopher and social theorist Murray Bookchin author of 24 books, which have been translated into more than 20 languages. Murray Bookchin is credited with originating the critical social theory known as social ecology, which had a major impact on the new left of the 1960s, the alter globalization movement, and more recently, the Kurdish autonomy movement with its anti-capitalist, reconstructive, ecological, feminist and communalist vision of social organization. Her mother, Beatrice Bookchin, is a longtime activist who worked alongside Murray for 57 years and ran twice for city council in Burlington, Vermont, as a radical municipalist candidate. Thanks, Debbie. And David Graber is a London-based anthropologist and anarchist activist perhaps best known for his 2011 volume, Debt, The First 5,000 Years, and his recent book, Bullshit Jobs, A Theory. He is professor of anthropology at the London School of Economics. As an assistant professor and associate professor of anthropology at Yale from 1998 to 2007, 
He specialized in theories of value and social theory. The university's decision not to rehire him when he would otherwise have become eligible for tenure sparked an academic controversy and a petition with more than 4,500 signatories. He went on to become a reader in social anthropology at Goldsmiths University of London from 2007 to 2013. His activism involves protests against the third summit of Americas in Quebec City and the 2002 World Economic Forum in New York City. Graeber was a leading figure in the Occupy Wall Street movement and is credited with helping create the slogan of we are the 99%. Thank you, David, and thank you, Debbie, for being here. And now I'm passing the word to you. Um, Debbie will thank start you. and we'll continue with Debbie. Thank you. I wanted to ask kind of, first of all, for a show of hands, has anybody here been to Rojava, to that part of northern Syria? And you don't have to put your hand up if you don't want to, of course, you know, but just to get an idea. Because one of the things that I thought I might do is just also show in a few minutes some photos of the area, because I think it's actually kind of hard to imagine that most of what we see about Rojava turns out to be just the militant fighters, you know, who are very important, of course, and have been the people who have really defeated ISIS and at great cost to themselves and to their to their families and, and to, the, in a certain sense, a whole generation of the society there. But before I do, I just wanted to say something kind of on a, on a personal level. You know, I, um, I'm obviously partly connected with this issue and with this movement in, a, in, a, in one sense because my father was very involved, even though he wasn't literally involved because he died before the Syrian war began. But because, of course, a lot of his ideas about decentralization and urbanization and grassroots democracy, radical democracy, and anti-authoritarianism and hierarchy were um, ideas that helped influence the Rojava revolution and that are very critical to it. But I'm also, in a very personal way, I find myself deeply committed to this issue because I feel that in a sense that anybody who is, as I am, very concerned about the future of this planet, the, the issues around immigration rights, the issues around authoritarianism and the growing and very deeply disturbing ultranationalism that we're seeing today, um, and all those related issues that we who are on the sort of progressive left care about, I think that Rojava is in a certain sense extremely critical to those of us who care deeply about those issues and that in a certain sense that it's the, like the threat to Rojava is very much an existential threat, in an existential sense a threat to us. That in a certain sense what's going on right now in Northeast Syria in terms of the importance of that movement and also the many powers that want to suppress it is a kind of a microcosm for the threat that all of us face here, the people who are on the left, who are considering themselves progressive, who care about, for example, not only the rise in fascism, but even the growing surveillance state that we're living under. And so one of the things that I really hope to, that we can do this evening is kind of make a case for really how profoundly important it is to support Rojava, not only in the moral sense, in the sense that the Kurds who have suffered for decades and decades under repressive rule really deserve a chance to engage in self-rule, to have their own society and to govern themselves the way they wish, but also, even if you want to put it in, a, in selfish terms, you know, for those of us who are concerned about terrorism and the responses to terrorism and what that means to all of us. And also to questions about the state and state violence and how the state 
is either responsive or not responsive to all of our concerns. So what I'm hoping is that people who might be here who are, have special interests in, you know, who are interested in, say, you know, Extinction Rebellion or who have gone to protests for women's rights will really relate to Rojava in a very deep way and sort of take, take home the, the importance of, of, uh, of, of what Rojava really can be for all of us and how important it is that Rojava gets our support in order to survive. So what I thought I would do is, um, I mean, I'm sure that probably a lot of people here are familiar. I'm going to just stand up and move over to here. I'm sure that a lot of people are familiar uh, already with this portion of northern Syria, which is Rojava, which started out as, oh, there we go. None of our networks are available. That's fine. It started out as, you know, originally after the, when the Syrian war broke out in 2011, and then uh, the Kurds basically declared in 2012 their sort of their autonomy. Um, originally, there were three cantons, uh, Jazeera, Kobane, and then Afrin. Now, as a result of uh, a lot of the territory that's been taken since then, there are seven what they call regions, which are listed right over here. And um, so the, it's really now about one third of, of Syria that is under, um, that is under, uh, I don't know if it's, you could call it rule, but that is being um, brought organized into, by. organized <laughs> by the Kurds and their many partners. And, and they very much emphasize the fact that it's a multicultural project. It's not just Kurds. There are Syriacs and there are the Yazidis who live there and there are certainly a large Arab population, but it's very much a project that comes from the Kurdish ideology that was developed by Abdullah Achalan. And are people here familiar with Abdullah Achalan? To some, yeah, Abo. Sarah Kapo. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, I won't go into a, a lot about, about that, but in, just in short, as many of you probably know, when he was captured in 1999, he really began a transition away from what we would think of as a sort of typical Marxist-Leninist seizure of state power ideology to this whole new idea of democracy, of grassroots democracy, recognizing very much that the state is really a problem and that seizing state power, as we've seen from the examples of the Soviet Union and, and many other examples, that this nationalist type of project wasn't really going to be the future for the Kurdish people or really for anybody who cares about uh, true democracy on the grassroots level. And his, his transition started, I mean, in 1999, after he was captured and sentenced to life in prison after his death sentence was commuted, uh, you know, he did a lot of reading, and, and, and that is one of the things that sort of sparked this big change in their approach to Kurdish liberation. But a lot of this also had started much earlier, even in the 80s and 90s, because the women's movement became very strong and very powerful in the Kurdistan uh, Workers' Party, uh, the PKK. And women were already asserting their rights, and they were pushing for gender equality. And Ocalan was extremely, uh, among many of the men in the party, the person very, very receptive to this. And he really made it so that women could become full partners in this liberation project. So these qualities continue very much to animate the whole Kurdish liberation movement of gender equality uh, they picked up since then in the, in the um, early 2000s, ecology, social ecology, and uh, also grassroots democracy. You could sort of talk about those as the three pillars right now of the Kurdish liberation movement. And what I thought I would do is um, just to talk a little bit about uh, I, first of all, I, I think it would be nice to sh give people an idea of, let's see if we can go to some photos, of some of what is going on there right now, some of what I was able to see when I was just there. I spent three weeks there, uh, just came back a couple of weeks ago, and let's see if we can um, do this. Um, it was... It was <laughs> 
profoundly interesting to see just how much uh, <coughs> Kurdish society in Rojava differs, for example, from Kurdish society right next door in Iraq. And let me see if we can turn on, a, get a kind of a slideshow going here. What I do is take you through a, a few pictures of, um, of what I saw. Um, because one of the things that was really fascinating to me was that, and I hadn't even realized this, was that when I came back from Rojava and I stopped in Iraq in a restaurant on the way back to where I was going to fly home, I realized that I was being spoken to by the men in the restaurant, the, the sort of owners and waiters who were catering to our table, which happened to be a table of women, in a way that was completely different from the way any man had spoken to me in Rojava. It was, it was like culture shock. You know, this, this guy, these guys came over and they said, so sweetheart, mm -hmm. would you like some tea now? You know, and I realized that for three weeks, Nobody had spoken to me in that in that voice. Nobody had taken that. No man had taken that that sense of liberty. And so, one of the things that I want to emphasize is just how powerfully this revolution is a feminist revolution. It's it's like not even on the table anymore. The question of oh, do women deserve this or do women deserve that? It's just complete gender equality in every sense. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the fact that. Women are co-chairs of every administrative uh, office, you know, whether it's a mayor of a town or a political office uh, as part of a party, and that they hold 40% of every legislative office, which is also, and, and in reality, they're actually more like 50%. And women are really leading society in every respect. Just everywhere you go, you see it. And I'll, I'll describe that a little bit more. Let's see if we can make this slideshow work. These are some scenes, and uh, this is what you see when you get there. It's a little hard to do this, but I'll get to it now. You can see beautiful, fertile areas that in the summertime actually turn brown because it's the dry season. But in the spring and the fall, it's very green, and there's, they grow wheat, and they have, it's actually a very, very fertile area. And <laughs> there are lots of checkpoints in Rojava, and the roads are very bad. I'm just going to go forward. This is uh, kind of some of the city scenes. People are trying, even under the, uh, you know, even with ISIS having been a threat. This is an example of a checkpoint where, where. And uh, I know you're. Not. <laughs> Oil is uh, plentiful, but they have no way to refine it. And as you can see, there's like a lot of you know places where people are sort of living their everyday lives, and yet there's also a, a sense of ruin. There's you know un, unfinished buildings and rubble in the streets, and they really lack money for infrastructure. This is a family: husband, wife, and a baby <laughs> on a motorcycle. Um, they do beautiful work in gold. I, those are the kinds of things that are only for very special occasions. And the Asaish is the sort of local police force. There is still very much a sense of threat from the outside. From I mean, even though Daesh, ISIS, has supposedly been vanquished, everybody is quite aware that there's still sleeper cells. And so there's a lot of security issues. You, the roads are terrible, the, there's sheep on them. There's <laughs> I've heard people say that there were times when the, they got as many car accident victims in the hospital as they did um, wounded soldiers. And this is um, an example of a uh, memorial for, it's a one year memorial for Anna Campbell, who was the British woman who went to uh, Rojava to fight and, and died in Afrin, and whose body has still not been uh, reclaimed, recovered. And for another woman from Argentina, Legarina. And, and these situations with the fallen are really very ever present because 11,000 people died in the fight against ISIS, in the fight in the last 
basically five years. And they are, and one of the, it was one of the first things that I did when I was there was to go to one of these uh, memorials. And sadly, there were several more while I was there as well. I'm just going to forward. This is a cemetery for the fallen in Derrick. And it contains the graves of a lot of internationalists and also a lot of local people. And uh, cemeteries are ever present there. Um, just you can see on the far side here, in the top part here, these are fresh graves. And they're always enlarging the cemeteries. It's unfortunately a very big fact of life in Rojava. Um, these are people at the Rojava Information Center, which is a kind of new sort of relatively new news outlet that is trying to help disseminate information about Rojava. I spent some nights with families, every family, this family included, and talked to this wonderful mom and her daughter about, about why they're never turning back on this feminist revolution. And every family has martyrs. And these are some just some images from the internationalist commune, which maybe during questions and answers we can talk a little bit about. They're doing some great work there. They're trying to really work on the social ecology aspect of Rojava. They want to replant pomegranate trees and all the olive trees and different things that uh, have uh, been sort of erased, were erased by the Assad regime when they tried to make Rojava dependent on Syria and Turkey for resources. These are little olive shoots. <coughs> this is a beautiful book, by the way, that they've done called Make Rojava Green Again, which I highly recommend. And we have a few of them for sale. Banned in Germany. Banned in Germany, <laughs> right. Because it has a picture of a chalan in it. They have very primitive living conditions there. And they people sometimes say, well, I want to go live there. And people should just know that if you go, you <laughs> you know, it's it's pretty basic. Um, uh, they have an academy, and there are many academies in Rojava, and one of the things that Ochelan and my dad really emphasized a lot is the importance of education, and they are constantly reading and studying and sort of becoming familiar with radical history and with anthropology, and, and then there are special women's academies. There is some pictures that I took where I just took sort of peripheral things without people's faces in them for their own sort of security. The, the women are incredibly empowered there. This is the women's TV sort of gin television and they are doing their own you know TV work. This is another TV station that they have um, that is uh, very active and puts out several news shows a day. But for the most part, things are very low tech there. And uh, they really suffer from lack of resources because of the embargo, uh, the longstanding embargo by Iraq, and of course, Turkey, which has built a huge wall along the border. These are a couple of sunsets. Rojava has beautiful sunsets. It, it means west, of course, and Kurdish because it's the westernmost part of Kurdistan. And people are trying to live their everyday lives. They have little shops and there's um, a very important sort of aspect of life is recreating. These books, for example, are all books that are being rewritten in Kurdish and Arabic and the Syriac language so that they can kind of recreate their own culture and history, which was largely erased by, by the Assad regime, which tended to pit different minorities against each other. And so here they are, they're working and they're rewriting every textbook for every grade in all three languages. And then this is um, Mr. In Abdullah, who is a commander and spokesperson for the YPJ. I happened to be there during the first year anniversary of the occupation of, of Afrin by Turkey, which Aslam mentioned. It's, as you I'm sure all know, it's still going on. Turkey has engaged in just the most heinous demographic cleansing 
there's, I think, 350,000 Kurdish people were forced out of Afrin. 170,000 of them still live right now in, out in the open in camps and in a refugee camp. And uh, it's one of the things that I hope that we can sort of help get your support in trying to oppose. I think the, the Turkish government's the sort of acceptance, that's Salih Muslim, one of the leaders of the PYD, the main Kurdish party. I got to tour the Rojava University, very basic uh, facilities, but they're working very hard to do things like teach agriculture. And, and uh, there's a quote from Voltaire. <laughs> and uh, chemistry and other things. They have some books, but they're also missing. There's a lot, of some, and some of them are, Pardon? And a lot more than when I was there, so that's good. But then but there's still, that. Yeah. <laughs> you really need to settle and maybe, here. Yeah. I was asked to give some talks on social ecology, and I did one here at the university. And, you know, they were, uh, kids were really, like, astute and asked great questions. It's all through translation. And they're very engaged. Um, <laughs> when you can't when you don't have a translator handy, sometimes you have to use uh, Google Translate to communicate. And uh, that's uh, Fuza Yosef, another uh, leader of the women's movement in Rojava. And you see that every house is heated with these kinds of stoves that use the, really the most basic kind of, basically what we think of as diesel fuel, you know. so. There's a lot of air pollution there, unfortunately. They're trying to make Rojava green again, but it's, it's not easy because they can't really refine their own oil. So a lot of it is, uh, you know, at a pretty crude level. There are even camels in Rojava. And then there are refugee camps, and as I'm sure most people have followed the news know, there, right now there's one camp, the Al Hol camp, where there's 72,000 they're not refugees, they're really prisoners in a certain sense of, they're ma mainly, many of them, tens of thousands of them are ISIS families. That camp that you just saw was, uh, was not, was for refugees who've come from other parts of Syria. And uh, I was able to go to Kobani for Nuraz, which is the Kurdish New Year, which celebrates rebirth and is a very important holiday there. And uh, these are some streets for, uh, street scenes from Kobani. And um, when the night before Nuraz, the custom is to light fires because fire is an important part of that celebration, um, you know, signifying again sort of rebirth. And so the whole of Kobani becomes covered the night before Nuraz, the holiday in smoke, in fire, and it's quite an experience. It's like the sky literally becomes black and everybody goes to the cemetery because as I'm sure most of you know, Kobani was one of the, was the first place really where, Ang where ISIS was vanquished and the Kurds, he's making a flag in that scene. He's a flag of 300 meters long for the, for the celebration of Nuraz, which everybody celebrates communally in a big amphitheater. And um, so at the cemetery the night before, it's a very moving scene because 1,700 Kurds died in the defense of Kobani. You can see some of the, these are, this is the fire, you can see some of the pictures of the martyrs in those scenes. And so the whole sky is black, but in the cemetery, a candle is lit on every grave. And there's about 2,000 of them in the Kobani cemetery. This is an image of what it looks like as a monument, and, um, and it becomes actually, you know, real. It becomes somehow very real, just what the sacrifice has been of these people. And it's a sacrifice that is, in a sense, you know, has affected an entire generation. And the fact that, that Trump now has said that he just wants to sort of turn his back on Syria is something that I think is, is terrible morally, and I also think it's gonna be, my impression from being there is that, since there were bombings even while I was there, is that it's gonna be very dangerous. 
and, and I will talk in a minute also about what I saw and learned about the women who are in these the sort of ISIS wives, you know, who are still in these camps and are basically terrorizing a lot of people who refuse to subscribe to, you know, Sharia law and refuse to support them. So this is the Kobani Cemetery, and it, it's um, it's very hard to be there and not and not be profoundly moved by the immense loss of life there. Just the graves just go on and on and on. And then the next day for the Neuro celebration, thousands of people. It feels like you know half the city or most of the city comes to gather on the, in the, uh, this kind of, like I said, natural amphitheater, which is also a very important part of Kobani because it was taken by ISIS. Everybody is, every single person who comes is checked, you know, women by women and men by men, sort of to make sure nobody's carrying any explosives. And uh, there are a lot of wounded who come, and there are still many, many Kurdish and other Arab and other other people fighters who are, were wounded, and they have a big stage there, as you can see. And there's speeches and there's dancing and we'll just uh, forward on here. Uh, and it's a, quite a crowd. <laughs> And that, this person is a uh, sort of a special, what we would call a SWAT team type. They've now mm -hmm. been trained oh, as uh, an anti-terrorism. That was a woman, and they've trained men and women together. So they have an anti-terrorism yeah. unit. You don't generally see them except on something, on an occasion like this. I mean, they actually work very hard to keep police presence out of cities. Soldiers don't walk around with guns in cities. This is a wounded soldier, a wounded fighter. And uh, pictures again of the martyrs are everywhere, the people who have died. These are some kids who were playing in a uh, garden, if you could call it a garden, of a museum there of martyrs. And when you look at Kobani now, much of it has been rebuilt, but and part of it is deliberately being left and of course, everywhere you go, everybody offers you tea and chai, indoors, outdoors. And some of it is being left as a kind of monument to what happened there. Um, but there are also still people living in yeah. places like this that still are mostly rubble. There's five families that won't move out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they keep one area just the same so that people will remember what it was like. But it's also the, lots of people want to shoot movies that, so they get money out of it. Do they? Yeah. Well, that's good because they need it. Yeah. You can still find lots of shell casings, and they have, you know, a lot. This is basically what 80% of Kobani looked like in 2015. Yeah, that was a, that was a car bomb. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And Turkey is right across the border from Kobani. That's a Turkish flag, that's an ISIS tank. We're nearing the end here, but. So the women's movement is, as I said, very, very strong. And this is the Women's Academy. And they um, are, this is a celebration after the defeat of ISIS was officially announced and there was a huge, you know, cars honking and people going through the streets. This is a kind of an aerial, well, not an aerial view, but a view of Kobani as it has now been largely rebuilt. And this is a, a girl who's uh, a student, a young girl. She showed me the, the divot in her hand where she used to be smacked for speaking the Kurdish language when she was in grade school. Like everybody there, she knows how to use a gun. Every man, woman, and most practically children are trained. The other woman was a uh, Christian uh, woman who was in the government of Kobani, and that's Ilham Ahmed, who's basically the de facto uh, 
sort of leader of the Syrian Democratic Council, and then Nuri Mahmoud, who's a uh, spokesperson for the YP, uh, for the YPG. And what I wanted to just stop this, I just wanted to show you in this picture, this, uh, this room is called, a, it's a women's house. And again, this is a, another sort of example of how women are really in big leadership roles. Every neighborhood in all of, in, in, in the cities and certainly in every village has a women's house in it. And what these women's houses do is they are like sort of unpaid, um, although now they're, they're earning some salary, but to go there you don't have to pay. They are like mediators for the whole community. And people can come there, not just women, women, men, anybody who has an issue, whether it's an economic issue or very often it's a woman coming, you know, who's having a problem with her husband or a father. When I was there, I saw them mediate between, you know, two, two cases, a one woman who was actually being hit by her husband and another one who was having problems with her father. But it's quite an extraordinary alternative form of justice. And it saves, there's really tens of thousands of cases that they mediate every year and they don't, and people therefore don't have to go to courts. It's not sort of justice by judges. It's rather a communal form of justice where the women, they're, they're elders, and they, uh, and they work things out. This is one of them sitting, sitting behind her desk. This is a group of them that wanted to, you know, pose with me, and uh, it's actually a, it's really an extraordinary model. And for those of us, you know, who are concerned about criminal justice reform, it really bears studying. This is the women's uh, community called Jinwar, and they've built their houses in what they call the Kobani style, <laughs> and they have a, a wonderful women's community. This is a, this was a martyr, a woman, a girl's sister who died um, in Afrin. Here's the, here the women are having a study group together. And this is just a, a commune meeting. Um, one of the things is, you know, you know, that's critical to this whole idea of democratic confederalism is the idea that people will meet together in their neighborhoods locally and make decisions and that, that in that way, the, the desires of the community flow upward rather than downward. People don't just go and vote for somebody <clears throat> the way we do and hope that that person will do the right thing and you know that they more or less have some policies that we agree with. Rather, in, in Rojava, a lot of the decisions are made from the bottom up. So people, if you see the people in this community are of all ages and they represent different aspects of life. There's a woman who works on health issues. There was the guy in the back there who represents youth. There are people who do economic, infrastructure, education, all of those things. And they meet twice a month and they report on what's going on in their neighborhoods and they delegate and then send people to meet with other members of other communities and in that way, it's really uh, a situation where the power, like I said, is flowing upwards and where people feel invested and they're talking to their neighbors. And it's a very important, I think, model uh, for those of us, again, who want to find a kind of a way forward with our progressive politics that's beyond just figuring out whether to vote for Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, you know, and or just protesting in the streets. It's sort of like a third way, you know. That's their little administrative office. This is just a women's cooperative. Um, they were doing, it was a restaurant, that particular cooperative. This is a little parliament building built by a Dutch architect in Derrick, and it sort of celebrates communalism. It celebrates different aspects of Rojava society on their, you know, on the beams there. And, um, and that's, I think we're pretty good now. And there's a goat, right, in the <laughs> parliament area. <laughs> it just sort of shows you, you know, the kind of the juxtaposition. And this is the bridge, which we saw briefly for a second on the way in, this is on the way out. And you can see that when the Tigris River gets high, Pardon me? Samalka? Yeah, that? exactly. That's Samalka, and that's the Peshawar crossing. For a long time, David, when you went there, there was a boat, right? There yeah, was yeah, no yeah, bridge. Both times I went there, I mean, no, there was a bridge, but oh, they, was it there? wasn't that people couldn't go, it was just goods that were going back and forth. Yeah, 
Yeah. They basically, you know, like Coca Cola could cross, but like electrical parts can't. You know. Right. Yeah. But when the Tigris gets very high, I mean, it just shows you how, like, their infrastructure is very, very uh, precarious still. So we had to wait a couple of days to cross back over because the bridge was basically falling apart, you know, because of the water. It was so high because it was a lot of rain, and also Turkey was releasing water. Turkey does everything that it can to try and constrict the economy of the region, including often damming the rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, so that they don't have enough water for irrigation. And then in a situation like this, when you don't need more water, opening the dams, you know, mm -hmm. to make it to make life more difficult. And uh, you know, so that's. I think we can. Well, this will come and go off. You know, I think we can stop there. That's like my my little Rojava uh, tour. Tour, um, and uh, you know, <laughs> I don't want to um, take up too much time. And I really would love to be able to have conversation. So maybe I'll turn it over to you, David. And you know, okay. what do you want me to about? talk about? Exactly? I mean, I think it would be interesting. <laughs> I think it would be interesting to talk about. I mean, first of all, you, you can talk a little bit about the economy, but if you, you know, about economic cooperatives, but also just about the fact, you know, how Rojava is really trying to create a stateless society yeah. and what that means, you know, yeah. and why that's important. Okay, and maybe a little bit about the geopolitical situation. And that, after that yes, we have to come so. back to that. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I mean, Debbie covered the main points um, that I would have wanted to cover, but I could elaborate on some things. Um, and, and one of them is that you know, this is really is an experiment in trying to create stateless democracy, um, or specifically feminist ecological stateless democracy. Um, and one of the things which strikes me is just that you know, you would think that the fact that, you know, several million people are living, uh, you know, for the first time in, since maybe the 1930s in Spain, are, you know, conducting a mass experiment in, in what a directly democratic stateless society would be like, would be of some interest to people around the world. You know, you'd, you'd think that would, this would be, you know, major news everywhere, uh, that it would be debated, discussed, uh, whether you're for it or against it. Um, but I find that even people who consider themselves devoted leftists, you know, often don't even know about this. Or if they do, the first reaction is just not to believe it. Oh yeah, they're faking it. I mean, for years I had to deal with people who just insisted that this was some kind of ploy. You know, like the PKK is actually the Stalinist organization, which they used to be, you know, Leninist, um, Marxist-Leninist sort of uh, group. But, and they went through massive transformations. But you know, the first reaction is a lot of people say, no, no, they're just faking it. They just want us to think that they're anarchists now. You know? As if there's a group of people who, if they wanted to gain more foreign support, would pretend to be anarchists. <laughs> <laughs> it like, completely makes no sense. You know? <laughs> you know, honestly, if you're going to fake an ideology, you're going to claim to either be liberals or, or, or Islamists, yeah. because that, those guys will give you weapons. But, um, you know. They're, they're trying to impress us, you know, good job. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so, so, so putting aside these uh, obviously absurd reactions, uh, there was, you know, it shows something about how, how little willing we are to, to believe that something like really, that we claim to all before is actually happening. Uh, and this is kind of a fascinating phenomena in itself. Um, but I want to talk about, uh, first of all, my own reaction, you know, like in any movement, there are more authoritarian and less authoritarian elements. There are struggles within over the direction of things. And this is, you know, it's true of any revolutionary situation. One of the things that I was very interested in when I was there was, you know, they say they're anti-state. Um, what does that really mean on the ground, you know? Uh, because it's one thing, you know, saying that in principle, but you want to look at the little things often. Well, for example, there was that, that museum section of Kobani, the area they kept wrecked. Um, it is true, there are like five or six families that refused to move. So the entire project of keeping that as, as like uh, a, a special museum zone has been really hampered by the fact that there are some people who refuse to move out, so they have to keep up power and services for them. Um, 
but you know it never occurs to them to kick them out. You know, so if this is like a, a, an authoritarian regime in disguise, you know, um, they, they hardly act like it. You know, uh, when they were talking about rebuilding Kobani, one thing that everybody discussed, I remember the first time uh, I went to Rojava, we met this guy, we called him the hippie doctor. Um, he was this guy, he looks like this sort of intense, you know, leather jacket, short cropped hair, sort of military guy. But, you know, as soon as he started talking, he was saying like, well, you know, we need to focus on prevention and our health plan. He was like in charge of health reform. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, heart disease, a lot of, you know, even a lot of cancer, so it's really caused by stress. We're all just too stressed. We need more trees, you know? Like, I didn't even be in the city. I get stressed. You know, after a day or two, I need to be around some trees. So, so he was planning to rebuild all the cities as well, at least 60% green space. And he says, you know, this will cause most medical problems to, like, rapidly decrease. Uh, but, but, you know, he thinks some place like Fobani is perfect for that. They said, well, you've got a city that's uh, over 60% destroyed. I guess you can try it out, right? Uh, and they were like, yeah, I know, we really wanted to do that. Uh, uh, but the problem is that everybody who's held, like, insists that when they rebuild it, they want to live in the exact spot they used to live. You know, it's like a matter of print. And so we got to do it, you know, because it's all bottom-up, directly democratic system. So, so if that's what they say, then they can't say no. Um, so it really is responsive, but uh, you know, based on, on bottom-up principles. <coughs> um, the other thing I looked into, which I thought would be the real giveaway, was cars. You know, because as you see, there's a lot of cars. I mean, most of the oil uh, it produced in Syria comes out of here. Uh, so the one thing they, also the wheat, the bread. Um, basically, Kamislo especially, but Rojava in general, um, was the breadbasket of Syria and the oil-producing region for the most part. And, but the Syrian government made a point of not having refineries or, or, or mills um, there, so that all the stuff had to be processed outside. So they've had to like smuggle parts and uh, to create those things now. Uh, but so cars, you know, there's cars and there's lots of oil. In fact, all the collectives and local neighborhoods well, they would get like free bread and free oil, and that was it uh, at first. Um, that was a sort of negative tax system. Oh yeah, that's the other thing, no taxes. Um, so that kind of shows there's no state, uh, but um, but the um, so 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 I, I I said well do you need a driver's license to like have a car? And they were like yeah right. Um, nobody has a driver's license. Uh, um, license plates. A lot of the cars had license plates. Other cars didn't. And you know sure enough, they'll issue a, you a license plate if you want. But that's mainly if you want to drive outside the region, you'll need one. Uh, speed limits, yeah, right. Um, but but there are traffic cops. There are guys who, who are uh, special division of the police who are traffic police. So I kind of, and you see them sometimes in the cities and sometimes they're directing traffic, but they do more than that. So I asked what they basically do and it turns out their main job, uh, and it makes perfect sense when you think about it, if you have no traffic laws whatsoever, um, is their job is to like pull children out from behind the wheels of cars and say, hey, you're 12, you, know, you, you can't drive, <laughs> cut that out. Um, so, so that's basically the traffic law they enforce. It's, you know, you're <laughs> old enough to reach the pedal. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so, so really, um, it is an you know, that kind of classic state institutions they've intentionally not restored. They have a justice system, they don't, they have, you know, the Asayis are not called police, um, they consider themselves uh, a, a security force that protects society and not the state, as they, as they put it. And, and, and theoretically, yeah. everybody can be trained to be assayish. In fact, yeah, you just show up. And, and, and that's actually what part of the interesting thing. I went to one of the academies. The academy system is important. I could talk about that. Because uh, another part of the idea of democratization is to get away from expertise. Because the Syrian regime, the Ba'ath regime, was entirely based on the sort of rule of technocratic experts. And the technocratic experts, among other things, well, aside from killing them a lot, uh, lied to everybody. Um, so, so they told them things like, oh, vegetables won't grow here, you know, um, so that they would be, you know, like to create dependencies between regions. Um, and you know, so people were convinced that a lot of agriculture just couldn't be done there, which actually it could. Um, and so, so as to make sure that nothing like this happens again. Uh, they have a, this academy system which offers six weeks courses and anybody can take one. Um, and they have economic ones that will teach you, you know, proper uh, plant health, but they'll also teach you how to organize a cooperative. They'll have um, 
uh, they'll have political ones, they will have feminist uh, academies, uh, a variety of different types of academies, and you can start your own. Um, we offer the, these courses, um, and one of them are security ones. And the, when we first went to one of these, um, they were talking about the six-week training it takes to become a member of the, uh, of the popular security forces, and they would say, well, first of all, we learned that you have to have um, one week on feminist theory before you're allowed to actually touch a gun. Um, but uh, the major thing that really impressed me was, uh, well, actually two things. One, another part that I thought this was very serious was they had one whole day where they were to discuss an atrocity that was carried out by the PKK, basically by their own side, during the sort of dirty war that was going on, the civil war in, in Turkey in, in the 90s. Um, to see what went wrong, that there was a you know, massacre and then a counter-massacre by the PKK guys um, in that event, and how to make sure that nothing like that ever happened again. Um, but um, the, what they finally said is, well, you know, ultimately we'd like to get in a position where the security forces, um, you know, the police don't carry weapons. Obviously not an option now. I mean, there are people who just come in and do suicide bombings and shootings in, like, uh, civil buildings all the time. Frequently, you know, they, they're under attack all the time. With people trying to infiltrate. So there's a reason why there's checkpoints everywhere. They said, well, you know, we'd like to get to that point. But what we really like to get to is a point where we give everybody in the country six weeks of secure police training and then abolish the police. Mm -hmm. That was the ultimate dream. Um, okay, so that's the ideal of the academy system. Um, how did I bring that up? Oh, I was talking about security. Um, so, so there's a security system. The idea is a security system is answerable to the bottom-up structures. And, and this is one thing that politically I think is actually really interesting uh, about Rojava as an experiment and as a political experiment we need to be thinking about because they're, you know, they're really encountering the kind of problems thinking about this and Occupy that, you know, and there was one point uh, after the evictions that I thought, you know, maybe we should get together a, a whole group of people, like, you know, we've got the unions, we've got all these allies, we've got all these intellectuals, and people with experience, and sit down and say, let's imagine we actually did get New York City, how would we run it, you know? Uh, and these people actually have that problem. You know, they're, 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 they have to, like, I mean, they're not cities like New York. Uh, they don't have a banking system that they have to worry about. Um, uh, in a lot of ways, it's a very undeveloped um, economy. But, you know, nonetheless, they, um, you know, they have to run the sewer system, they have to run the electrical grid, they, um, they, they have to work out all of these problems, but, but even more, they have to relate to other entities. And um, one thing, you know, when you actually have to solve these problems, things you wouldn't have necessarily anticipated become things, sometimes things that you thought were going to be hard turn out to be easy, but other things you never even occurred to were going to be problems at all turn out to be really hard. And, and one of the big problems that you have if you're trying to organize a bottom-up democratic confederate direct, you know, feminist ecological direct democracy is how to deal with, with, with outside organizations which are organized on totally different principles. And this is something that crops up any time you're trying to do a, a, a organization that operates on principles of uh, democratic principles and it's a big thing in anarchist circles. Um, you know, how do you deal with organizations that are top down? But it's a big problem if you're doing something like creating an autonomous region. You don't want to be a nation state. You don't want to be a government uh, or a state. But you have to be taken seriously and enter um, it, you have organ both with states and organizations that assume that anybody worth dealing with is a state. <coughs> and this was really brought home to me when, um, when I was in Kamisla. There's one area of Kamisla, which is like the largest city in Rojava. Uh, well, I guess Mumbai just now, if you consider it part of Rojava. But Kamisla is uh, sort of the center of it. All uh, If it had a capital, that would be it. Um, okay, in Kamisla, there's actually an area still under Syrian government control. Because the you know, Syrian government basically, there was a negotiation and they agreed to leave. Um, so they pulled up stakes and left. They took out everything. They took out the light bulbs from the government building, just stripped the place bare, took off. Um, and all the sort of flunkies and crony capitalist friends of the regime left too, which meant that the land problem wasn't nearly so much of, of a problem as it was going to be uh, otherwise. But, um, okay, so the government took off, but there's one area that's still there. And it's like one street around the central post office, which leads to the airport. 
and the airport is still under official government control. And I realized, like, well, that kind of makes sense because if you have an airport, what are you going to do with it? I mean, it's not like they have military planes, right? Um, but, um, you know, in order, to, and, and it made me think of all the legalities and structures that are required. I mean, if you want to fly a plane from, you know, from Pamislo to anywhere else, you're going to need aviation agreements, you're going to have to be signatory to, you know, security agreements, commercial agreements, safety agreements, and you can't do that unless you're a state. You know, they assume the existence of a nation state system where only states, which are, you know, institutions which claim a monopoly, of course, of violence within a given territory, you know, legitimate use of force, of force, only those entities can sign documents like that. So, you know, if, if you have two airports, you could, you know, fly back and forth between them, but if you just have one, you know, you can't do anything unless you're a state. So they just kind of left the Syrian government in, in charge of the airport, so occasionally they could like medevac people who needed dialysis or something to a hospital in Damascus. Sometimes they'll let them, sometimes they won't. Um, but otherwise, you know, what are you going to do with an airport? Um, and, and it shows that, that the whole international state system is set up in such a way you need something that looks sort of like a government. So what they've done in Rojava is, I think, really fascinating uh, for revolutionary theory in general. Is it's a kind of a dual power system. But it's a dual power system where the same guys effectively set up both the top-down and the bottom-up structures, which are in some ways in tension with each other. Um, there's the PYD, which is uh, the, the, basically the sort of parallel to the PKK as a political party, Syrian branch, um, which organized the, the, most of the, what they call the self-governance structure. And that looks like a state. Uh, in that it has government ministers, it has parliament, um, and um, they've had elections. There's like, I think something like 50 political parties in, in Rojava, I mean, of which one is so much larger than all the others that it's kind of a joke. Um, you know, they are always, a lot of the other political parties, uh, they actually claimed it was really true. There was one party that had a split because they had two members and they got divorced. <laughs> but, um, but, but, yes, yeah, so there's a lot of really small political parties. Uh, but, but, you know, there are political parties. And, um, but, but at the same time, they have a group called Tevdam, which is sort of movement for a democratic society, it means, um, which is seven different groups, including the PYD, but a lot of other ones, uh, sort of the women's movement, various other groups got together to, to sort of coordinate the creation of the bottom-up structures. The bottom up structure, like every hundred houses has a little council, and then they, they confederate on two higher levels, uh, up to the municipal level. And um, that's where you have these popular assemblies, you need, which need a 40% women's quorum to, to operate, that are also balanced by an all-women's uh, assembly that can veto any decision they make that they say you know, has effects on women, which is basically all legislation. Um, and each of those has the security and the educational and the so forth and so on working groups, um, which also send delegates to you know the uh, larger and larger levels. So they have a bottom-up structure. And what people will say is, well, this is you know yes, there's a top-down structure and there's a bottom-up structure. They say this is not a state because a state is a monopoly over course of force, and all anybody with a gun is answerable to the bottom-up structures and not the top-down ones. And, and the first time I was in Rojava, you know, this was very clear because some of the debates that were going on, I remember um, we went to one assembly where they were talking about this. There was a, somebody they thought was hoarding sugar to uh, price gouge, and they wanted to call in one of these Asaij people to go into his house to see if it was true. Um, and he said, oh, you know, I can't do that unless I get, like, permission from my commanding officer. And they got outraged. Uh, and they said, like, I can't believe this happened. We need to know who do we complain to. Uh, you know, what the hell? We are the uh, security working group of this region. They answered us. They don't uh, answer to some commander. What the hell is this about? Uh, this is how hierarchy comes in. You know? um, <laughs> what do we need, some kind of hat or something? They're actually going to vote on making a hat for themselves so that the, the cops would pay attention to them. Um, but, um, but this is the kind of debate that goes on. And I mentioned there are some exceptions to this, right? Because it's not as if local assemblies can do anything. There is a, what they call a national consensus of certain principles. Um, and there are, 
are some, and there is one security force that can intervene even, dis, uh, even despite what a local council decides, but that's strictly on women's issues. So, for example, if a local assembly decided to reinstitute polygamy and child marriage, that would not be okay. And there is like a women's security force that would come in and say, no, no, cut, cut that out. <coughs> and they're armed. Um, and and <laughs> you have to pay attention. Um, so, so there are certain you know, ways they've had to balance and work that out. But essentially, that's, that's, um, it is effectively a dual power system. And one of the interesting questions is how much foreign influence will reinforce or strengthen the sort of technocrats uh, in, in, in the thing which it kind of looks like but isn't a government. Um, and that's why it seems all the more important for people like us to give as much uh, support as possible to the bottom-up initiatives, which are you know, really remarkably transformative. I mean, the people in the top-down things are well-meaning, and they don't, and they don't it's not like they're, they're enemies, right? Um, but you know, creeping bureaucratization can happen in these situations if you don't constantly monitor it and make sure it doesn't. Um, one of the things about the geopolitical situation I wanted to talk about, uh, which I think is really important, is um, the question of Rojava's, well, probably we'll get questions about this. Um, I mean, I think that people don't really understand the role of Turkey in this situation and, and, and you know, sort of the NATO and imperialist interests in the region. Um, you know, we're having a period where the American empire is in many ways in rapid decline, which is cool. Um, <laughs> but, um, but it also means that you know other elements are um, coming in as, as sort of minor uh, or not so minor empire imperial forces of their own uh, uh, regard. So in the region, you know, there's a play of forces in Syria. You know, there's the U.S. is just one among uh, Turkey. Uh, well, I, Iran is a big player, Qatar, uh, the Saudis. Uh, um, there's all these different forces which are all um, playing various, uh, Russia obviously, uh, play, playing you know, very, very complex games. Uh, so that, for example, you know, a lot of the tension between um, Qatar and Saudi Arabia is that one of them backs like Nusra, which is Al-Qaeda, and one of them backed ISIS. You know, and they're having this little proxy war between them. Um, and um, so, so there, and, and it is a sad thing that in most of the Arab majority areas of Syria, I mean, there was an amazing nonviolent bottom up revolution which led to the creation of popular assemblies and councils, many of which were directly anarchist inspired, um, in other parts of the country. And, and it's important to bear in mind this wasn't something that just happened in the Kurdish areas. Unfortunately, um, there was a, not a lot of coordination, and the Kurdish um, and, and and something hap different happened in the Kurdish areas and the other parts uh, of Syria when the revolution eventually militarized. Which was in the Kurdish areas, they created their own defense forces, which largely at first were interested in defending their own region, uh, and and um, rather than carrying out offensive operations against the government, which is had, had basically abandoned the area. They were trying to create a revolutionary society and concentrated on that. Um, in other areas, the, the, the secular revolutionaries and the leftists in general and uh, people involved in the assemblies made a strategic decision not to form armies and militias. But as a result, all these foreign powers rushed in and basically supported their own uh, various factions, many of which were just extraordinarily right-wing reactionaries. Um, and uh, so there's a huge split. Well, in many places, they would have like you know, scary Al Qaeda guys doing the uh, armed stuff, and like you know, then there was like a women's center and popular assemblies and so forth operating on the ground. I mean, in many places, those, that stuff was eventually suppressed, but not everywhere. Um, anyway, so so this situation was very different in different parts. But the, the the kind of imperialism that was going on, I mean, Turkey is one of the biggest players, and and we have to remember that Turkey is the second largest army in NATO. Turkey is a NATO power. Um, it, its army is entirely supported by Europe and America. 
So when people talk about imperialism, there's a kind of a very weird double game where the U.S. was like basically had little choice but to like go against ISIS since ISIS declared war on them, um, and um, the only people willing to they found were willing to fight ISIS um, was were the guys in Rojava. Um, so they entered into a military alliance. It was a military, but not a political alliance. Uh, in fact, the U.S. has been systematically opposed to even allowing Rojava to be involved in the Syrian peace talks. I mean, Russia has been more willing to. The Russians have been no friends uh, either. Um, yeah, so, so it's not like these guys are a puppet of America. There, there was a military alliance of convenience on both sides. But at the same time, you know, Turkey made sure that, that Rojava the YPG, um, YPG and the YPG, the defense forces did not get like anti-tank weapons or anti-air weapons or anything they could defend themselves against the Turkish army. Now the Turkish army has been threatening to invade the region for ages and uh, has made it clear they want to do so. Um, in fact, the very moment it seemed like ISIS was defeated, the first thing they said is, great, can we invade now? Um, and, uh, and, and, America would have allowed them to had it not been for various political uh, reasons they finally had to pull back. Uh, but it's incredibly important to understand the role of Turkey because Turkey is part of this imperial establishment. Right? It's a NATO army. And it, pl it plays a really important security role, which is basically keeping the refugees out of these proxy wars, which, which uh, Europeans and Americans have started and, and are keeping up from sweeping into Europe. And a threat which is constantly using, Erdogan's constantly saying, okay, fine, don't pay me, you know, don't give me what I want, I'll just unleash the refugees. Um, so essentially the Turkish army protects the eastern <coughs> flank of NATO. I mean, often, you know, to the point of machine gunning refugees at the borders, yeah. Um, and what essentially happened is, is that they keep brokering that into allowing them to be more and more aggressive against their own Kurdish population, their Kurdish neighbors. Um, for various reasons, Turkish nationalism takes on this very exclusionist um, quality, as done so since the Armenian genocide at least. Um, and um, so that, for example, very few people are even aware that there was a kind of a civil war that happened within Turkey a few years ago after the last election when um, you know, most of the Kur Kurdish majority cities uh, essentially declared their own self-governance and autonomy and tried to create democratic and federal structures there um, and, um, you know, built barricades and moats around the cities and um, the Tur Turkey rather assumed, they assumed basically after um, Erdogan had sort of played the, the, the long story. Erdogan, when he came in, tried to actually um, engage in peace talks with the PKK. And the PKK at that point was essentially trying to adopt it what, what probably kind of a Zapatista inspired strategy. He said, great, we're gonna withdraw our military forces, we're gonna stop any sort of operations, military operations uh, other than in self-defense. We'll keep our, uh, they moved off to Kandal, which is this area in Iraq that is sort of natural fortress where it's almost impossible to get people. Um, and they said, all right, we, we'll enter into peace negotiations. And like the Zapatistas, they knew perfectly well the government was going to negotiate in bad faith and never give them what, uh, you know, autonomy. But they said that's okay because we can use that as cover to create sort of directly democratic structures on the ground, which is what the Zapatistas did too. Well, it was it, it turned out to be easier to do in Chiapas than it was in Turkey, and they kept arresting and killing people. And, um, so eventually, uh, at, but, um, and, um, oh yeah, the other thing which is very important and um, the media refuses to really talk about is the degree to which ISIS and Turkish intelligence are often very difficult to distinguish from one another. Um, this is something that's really interesting, interesting reflection on the news because if something is like so shocking and outrageous that, you know, if it were true, something would have to be done Often the reaction is simply to say, it can't, therefore it can't possibly be true, and all evidence is thrown away. I mean, you talk to people about, you know, sort of Al-Qaeda and ISIS ties to the Turkish government in, in the region, and everybody's like, 
obviously, you know, I mean, how much evidence they need. You know, they're constantly finding ISIS commanders like Turkish intelligence IDs in their pocket. And it's not subtle at all. Uh, there's this piles and piles of evidence that, um, you know, uh, it was other forces involved in Qatar, certain forces in Iraq, uh, in setting up ISIS, but, but um, you know, Turkey was a big one. And Turkey was openly trading with ISIS. I mean, there's these oil convoys coming out of ISIS areas into Turkey all the time. You say, oh, they're smuggling oil. It's like, yeah, you can smuggle diamonds. They're small. You, know? you can't smuggle a bulk product. It's not like they don't know. There's thousands of trucks crossing the border. You know? um, yeah, so it was all, especially considering the guy doing the smuggling turned out to be Erdogan's like, son-in-law. Um, <laughs> but, um, all right, so it's pretty obvious what was going on. Um, but um, we're, we're not allowed to say that. Um, so, so, and, you know, so one thing that started happening was at, when the, the way they broke off the peace process with the PKK, uh, there was a string of, of ISIS suicide bombings. It was kind of a clever strategy. They said, oh, we need to intervene against ISIS, and also those terrorists of the PKK. Um, but in fact, the ISIS suicide bombings in Turkey only hit like Erdogan's arch enemies, basically people who were like Kurds and leftists. Um, and um, so, so it was a kind of way of killing two birds with one stone, terrorizing the opposition and saying, oh, ISIS hit us, we, now we need to strike back, but we're gonna hit, strike back at the same guys ISIS just blew up, right? Um, so what, at that point, you know, people thought that all of this was just his way of gaining a supermajority in parliament to give himself dictatorial powers, which he did. And they thought afterwards he was going to play the peacemaker. So they said, okay, we're going to declare autonomy and you know, sort of grab a position, in, 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 um, hoping to, you know, for advantageous negotiations, we can finally get the autonomy we've been fighting for all these years. And sure enough, um, Erdogan said, no, actually. I'm going to just blow up my own cities. So, like you know, large parts of, of of Kurdish towns and cities were just completely destroyed. Endless numbers of people were killed. They had 24-hour curfews. People starved. People were massacred in various ways. Um, and somehow, this wasn't news international. You'd think in a, you know a war inside a NATO country, with like you know whole cities being blown away using American, French, Italian, weapon, British weapons would be news, but no. Um, so then he was, you know, Erdogan has been insisting he's going to, to uh, do the same in Syria. Now, it's an interesting question of why he got away with Afrin, I think, is um, because he did carry out an invasion there. And once again, to the almost complete silence of the in international community. Uh, and, and in fact, in, before he engaged in the invasion of Afrin, now, Afrin is a province, in most of the parts of, of Rojava are quite mixed ethnically, they're Kurdish majority, um, but there's all sorts of other people going, going on there. You know, Afrin was one of the only areas that's isolated from the other ones, but which was just overwhelmingly Kurdish. It was like some 97, 98% Kurdish population. Uh, it's now below 50. Um, and he said he was gonna do this. At the beginning of, of the attack on Afrin, Erdogan declared, um, well, Afrin isn't really a Kurdish place. It's really a Turkmen and Arab place where some Kurds came later and took over, but we're gonna return it to its rightful inhabitants. So basically, he you know, declared in advance, I'm going to invade this place and ethnically cleanse it. You know, it's rare that somebody declares in advance that they're going to commit war crimes, um, let alone does so with a NATO army, and nobody, nobody says a word. You know, there was, I don't think there was a single major government. When this happened, we were all waiting for the UN to like condemn it, for the, you know, all these different powers to do so. And, and part of the reason that he's been able to get away with this, and I think this is a really important uh, issue for political organizing, is the terrorist designation of the PKK. And, and this is something really important to think about because um, the PKK is on the terror list, basically of all NATO countries. It's, again, this is a NATO thing. Um, and the U.S., it's not on the U.N. or the, any of this, or even Switzerland. You know, anybody who's not part of NATO doesn't consider them a, a terrorist. And, and this was a, basically something Erdogan sort of master move when the PKK gave up their demands for a separate state, when they tried to 
do a Zapatista strategy and enter into negotiations, suddenly Erdogan went on this huge campaign to get them designated as terrorists, which they had not been before. You know, when there was an actual civil war going on and people were being killed right and left, they weren't considered terrorists. As soon as they decided to go eco-feminist, direct democracy, and not engage in offensive operations, suddenly they got declared terrorists. And, and everybody went along with this. And, and once you're declared a terrorist, um, well, you know, you can't have spokesmen, you can't raise money, you, you can't do anything. You're just completely silenced. And it made, made it possible for the Turkish state to just endlessly repeat, oh, terrorists, terrorists, border, terrorists. Uh, and and it's, it's, I always point to the irony of this because you know, Rojava is not an extension of the PKK in any political term. It's not like there's some guy making phone calls telling them what to do, right? Um, they're not part of the chain of command. They're autonomous. However, they share an ideology. You know, Ojalan's ideas are extraordinarily influential. You see pictures of Ojalan all over the place. It's basically the only person who's still alive you see a picture of. He's very much against cult of personality, of, of, of creation of living leaders. Uh, so you see pictures of martyrs everywhere, but not of um, anyone still alive except him. But, you know, he's the sort of imprisoned leader, uh, leader. He's sort of almost like a living martyr. Um, but, um, you know, so Ojalan's ideas are incredibly influential. Um, but what are those ideas? They're basically direct democracy, feminism, ecology. Um, and it, it's a bit of an irony because, okay, you know, back in the, fir uh, b back in the first Gulf War, uh, or no, no, the second Gulf War, the, the, the invasion of, of Afghanistan, Iraq, you know, George Bush was famously evoking uh, feminism as a, one of the reasons for doing it, um, lack of democracy. You know, the kind of line was, well, people in this region of the world, they're, they're patriarchal, they're sexist, so <clears throat> they're oppressive to women, they don't have any democracy, they're savages, it's okay to bomb them, you know? Um, that was the line. Um, now, all of a sudden, you have these people who are way more into democracy than Western powers, way more into <laughs> feminism than the Western powers, so they're like, well, that's not okay either, right? <laughs> I mean, because essentially, you know, the only reason they're designated a terrorism Terrorists is because they're too into ecology, direct democracy, and feminism. Um, so then it's okay to bomb them too. I guess the, the ideal is to hit just the right amount. Of, you know, it's like a three little bears thing. <laughs> just enough, not too much democracy, but just enough, not too much women's rights, but you know enough. Um, and then it's okay. We won't kill you. Um, anyway, so 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 during the invasion of Afrin. You know, there's this remarkable situation. Afrin was considered the most socially advanced because it had been very peaceful up till then. They hadn't really faced military assault uh, in any major way. So they developed the first university there. They developed a lot of social uh, things much further, according then, than they'd managed to do in places where they had to put so much effort into the war effort. Um, so, for example, Afrin, uh, in so far as they did have official, you know, posts. Um, like I think two thirds of them were held by women, which is historically probably unique. You know, I don't know. Um, you know, there's a lot of places where the person on the very top is female, but that doesn't like Queen Elizabeth. That doesn't mean much. Um, there's a lot of societies where you know you can make the argument on domestic level women are, are very powerful, but it's like the people in the middle that really matter, right? And those are always guys, right? Um, but here, you know, you have a situation where every you know at all levels it was mainly women who were running the things. So, um, and you'd think this would be considered, again, one of the great historical experiments, everybody discussing it, let alone when, when you know, an army and a turkey came in, you know, basically using as their military, bear in mind the Turkish military is kind of in bad shape since the coup, since almost all their competent officers are in jail. I mean, e um, even the, um, when they were flying air raids in Afrin, half those guys were actually in jail and they let them out to fly air raids and <laughs> put them back in again. Um, so, so, you know, there's just not a great efficient military. So what they basically relied on is their enormous technological superiority. They have these tanks and planes which are not only supplied but maintained. This is something I always like to emphasize because you forget this. You say, well, what can we do to stop Turkey? You know, they can do what they like. Well, no. All those military weapons, like, that give them, an, because, you know, the, they, well, yeah, they would kick their ass if it was just the Turkish military. If they didn't have, you know, total air uh, control and all these high-tech uh, uh, armor, armored stuff. Um, you know, 
all that stuff breaks down in three days unless it's maintained by you know engineers and experts who have replacement parts and do constant safety checks and you know jets you know becoming operable if they're not maintained in like three or four days. Um, so so those guys who are doing the maintaining are not Turkish. You know those guys are Europeans and Americans. So this is a, a, a basically an imperial army uh, that came into Afrin. Well, what are they? So why is it people allowed? You know, this imperial army to sweep into this part of Syria where they're conducting this huge feminist experiment. And the other thing he uses, basically, you know, Islamist auxiliaries, guys who like were Al Qaeda or you know um, ISIS like six months ago, but changed hats slightly, you know, put on different badges, and now they're Turkish auxiliaries. So you know, those are the same guys. They come in, they reimpose Sharia, they kick out half the population. Nobody's saying anything, right? Um, how did this happen? Well, it's because who they resettled there. Um, the people who have been moved in to all the houses of all the guys who've been kicked out of, of Afrin are the families of all the most extreme jihadists in other parts of Syria. So basically, there seems to have been either spoken or unspoken. I mean, it wasn't like a, it's not a conspiracy theory. He basically said openly he was going to do this. You know, he said, all right, I'll, if you let me drive the Kurds out of Afrin, I'll take all those guys you really don't want coming to Europe and put them there. So you know this is a this is an imperial operation. You know it was carried out by imperial weapons, but it means that you know we have this weird situation where the you know the guys who were like just a year or two ago like ISIS guys are now basically working for NATO to like suppress a, a, a feminist revolution and and. You know, as, as Erdogan continually says, well, I don't do what I like. You know, bombs are going to be going off in Europe. People won't be safe. It's safe to walk the street. You know, he's continually, essentially, con threatening and operating as an agent of European powers. So, so I, when, you know, when people talk about these U.S. troops who are basically there as human shields, um, as, you know, the only imperialist operation going on in the region, um, no, it's a lot more complicated than that. I mean, myself personally, obviously, you know, I don't want Americans in Syria. They have no business being there. Um, well, I think that what needs to happen is for, but you know, they're just there because America's real ally in the region, Turkey, is gets to keep all the planes and tanks, um, and the pe the people who are at there fighting ISIS, which Turkey wouldn't do, because Turkey kind of is ISIS, um, are are not allowed to have anti-tank and anti-plane weapons. Um, so if we allowed these guys to have the means to defend themselves, there would be no need to have Americans sort of sitting on the border so that if Turkey comes in, they die, and it would be a scandal, which is basically what the Americans are doing there at this point. Um, so, so I think that when we think about concrete interventions politically, getting the PKK off the terror list, which is ridiculous, you know, like put, it, it, that they're there, still there, is an absolute priority. Uh, second of all, um, Ojalan is currently completely illegally kept in isolation. You know, he's the person who was really trying to create, and, and you know, he's the person who's the, in the position to be the sort of mandate of the situation. Um, he, um, he's constantly been intervening to try to, to create peace talks. Um, he's in, completely not allowed to make public statements. He hasn't even been allowed to see a lawyer. And what is it? Uh, how many years now? Like Five years? Eight. Seven, eight years, my God, yeah. Um, he, um, and uh, at the moment, there's people all over the world, starting in, in um, Kurd uh, Kurds and prisons in Turkey, but spreading across the world in solitary. There's 7,000 people, is it so? Yeah. Um, who are on hunger strike to try to get Turkey to at least observe international law and allow him to have access to his attorneys to make public statements. Um, uh, he's in this island prison where there's only two other prisoners or three, and mm -hmm. he's completely surrounded and isolated there. Um, and, um, you know, so, so delisting the PKK, breaking the isolation on Ojalan, and allowing, you know, people to defend, the means to defend themselves. Uh, because we don't, they don't need Americans there if they, if they, if they are, you know, they're probably the most combat ready and combat experienced uh, force in the region. They don't need anybody to hold their hands or defend them. What they need is the means to defend themselves. Um, so, so if, um, you know, if those things happen, then the Middle East will start turning into a radically different place. 
And I think it's just remarkable that, you know, here, uh, we, the way people say, you know, this is the place where they came up with patriarchy. This is the you know, place where, where we're going to get rid of it. You know? um, we're <laughs> we're going to start to put an end to it. I mean, this is like world historic things that I, I never imagined would be happening in my lifetime. I think it's our responsibility to do what we can to help. I think it would be great to uh, open it up to discussion, questions, or comments. Um, I just wanted to add one thing to what David said, you know, about Turkey. I, I mean, this is incredibly important. And, and uh, while I am sort of all about municipalist politics and believe that we should really be working on the local level, I do think that this is one time when people could really make a difference by reaching out to national figures. In other words, I mean our congressmen, our senators, you know, having worked in Washington for several years when I was working for Sanders, I know that the impact of phone calls and letters, not so much letters, but particularly phone calls and tweets and, you know, communications with uh, officials can really impact them and make a difference. And there are some officials in Washington who are more sympathetic to the Kurdish cause. And one of the things I hope people will do is go on our website, um, which we, is listed right up here, the Emergency <laughs> Committee for Rojava. And you know we have information there about how to contact congressmen and women. And also, by the way, just to put in a pitch, I also hope people will donate. Because one of the things we're really trying to do, we have a PayPal account, and I hope people will donate. We're really trying to go around um, and help train people to do advocacy on this issue. And I really, just to add to what David said, you know, I think that what is going on with Erdogan and his incredibly hostile uh, efforts towards Rojava should really concern all of us, not just for the sake of preserving Rojava, which is incredibly important in itself, but it's, he's sort of destabilizing previously accepted norms about what constitutes human rights, you know, what constitutes a nation, whether a nation is allowed to simply go into another nation, you know, is this Nazi Germany and Poland, you know, what, what and, and that should concern all of us because it's kind of creating a new norm that allows people like Trump and even, you know, right now in the UK, they're talking about, I guess they've already passed a law that says that if you, oh, yeah. you know, that, that says that basically you, if you go visit a place like Syria and it's designated terrorist, you can be prosecuted. Or they're starting to do more like what Germany has done. Germany, basically, you cannot carry a picture of Ocalan in the street or a banner that has a YPG or a YPJ on it because, because of that terrorist designation. That's something that should concern all of us who not only care about human rights, but care about freedom of expression and about our own abilities to organize down the road. I mean, we are truly becoming a surveillance society and uh, a place where, like I said, the norms are just slowly shifting. And I think it's something so that's very important. And also, you know, as David mentioned about the hunger strikers, you know, four people have died already. Nine. And nine people have died already. Thanks. Well, yeah, and, and uh, you know, it just, it's very serious, and so anything people can do to uh, reach out to our so-called leaders uh, to make them aware that people care is incredibly important right now. But anyway, let's open it up to, to questions or comments. Sure. So recently there were municipal elections in Turkey, mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering, what implications this has, if any? Do you do that? Sure, go I ahead. Mean, you're like well, no, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just all kidding. right, well, I mean, yeah, there has been an economic collapse in Turkey. And, you know, when I was, last time I was in the region, everybody was saying, well, our only hope is that, like, you know, Erdogan's been blowing bubbles and, you know, uh, the, the economy is built on sand. It's all going to collapse. Maybe then we'll have some chance of getting a more reasonable person in there. Um, that did start to happen. Unfortunately, he got his whole, you know, essentially dictatorial, effective dictatorial powers before that. 
But then the last election, the municipal ones, the, the, the collapse was really hit. And, I mean, the, and, and, and a lot of his rhetoric has gotten basically to like the kind of thing you'd expect from spiraling before a fall dictator guy. Um, you know, saying, why are you complaining about the price of avocados? Are you even talking about the price of bullets to kill terrorists? You know, this kind of thing. Um, it, unsurprisingly, they didn't watch well with the general public. And um, he ba kind of lost a lot of the municipal elections. In the Kurdish regions, he had a very simple solution for that. He just arrested all the guys who won and said, ah, he didn't win, and put the losers in. Yeah. I have a uh, theoretical question about democratic confederalism. Mm -hmm. So it arise in uh, Rojava, though, too, a vacuum, the state was collapsed. It basically so, left, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm wondering, in uh, other regions of Rojava, or in the world in general, uh, is state collapse the only way to establish democratic confederalism, or is there also theorized that it's possible to go through a parliamentary Gradual way I think that would be what for Debbie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, I, uh, we I have just happen to have <laughs> handy this fabulous book. It's called Fearless Cities, A Guide to the Global Municipalist Movement. And actually, I brought it on purpose because I really think these things are very connected. And, you know, I think that ultimately one of the other very important ways that we can support Rojava is to start doing that kind of politics here. And I know that there's a lot of resistance to this. I know, you know, there are often people say, oh, no, no, you know, we have to seize state power. That's the only way. Or there is a sort of a more, you know, anarchistic tendency to be on the more periphery. We don't want to get involved in local politics. But one of the things that I think this book does, and that also my dad's book, The Next Revolution, Popular Assemblies and the Promise of Direct Democracy does, this more theoretically, this more practically, is that it talks about how this whole system of confederating local communities that start to take power really can have an impact. Because it's happening, you know, it's in Barcelona and many communities throughout Spain, they're doing this. And, and I have good friends in um, Bologna, Coalizione Civica, where they're starting to do this. And one of the things that I think is really important about what's happened in Rojava, and that really needs to happen in the West, or you know, the big West, the world, worldwide, is that they are really trying to reinvent what it means to be democratic. You know, we go in and we, we vote, and that's our so-called democracy, and the, we sort of call ourselves constituents, you know. But we're not really the constituents of the state. The state, all it really does is oppress us and send us into war and do these terrible things. And, and what this movement, this municipalist movement says is it's time to devolve that power away from the state by taking more and more power at the local level. And, they, and, and, and municipalists believe that even big problems, things like global warming, can be solved by confederated communities working together. And in fact, we see that a lot. There are a lot of localities that are passing their own air pollution word, uh, laws that want to become carbon neutral, that kind of thing, you know, by a certain time. So I know that people think, wow, well, things are su such an emergency now, and, you know, we don't have time to vote in our people to, to have meetings, to start affinity groups, to read together, study, and eventually run somebody for, say, a local school board or a local city council. But in fact, that's exactly what the right has done in this country for the last 50 years. That's why they're in power. While the left was busy just protesting, they were working on the local level. And I really think that these things are incredibly into, um, interconnected, that what's going on in Rojava is an in extraordinary model. And yes, obviously, it's much easier if the state withdraws. We don't have that luxury. But we have to do something. And 50 years of protesting alone, you know, or just hoping I that the, just the protesting. <laughs> or no, no, not just protesting. And I'm not talking about you. I'm just saying there are, you know, certain people who. I mean, you know, there's obviously other things have gone on. There's union organizing efforts. People are building co-ops. People are doing all those things. And I think those things are great. I just think that if we could start to do something like what they've done there. You know, they built a social contract. It has 96 provisions. It says, this is what we stand for. And people can do that, you know, in local assemblies. And they are doing it in, in certain cities in the United States. They've started to do that a little bit in Portland. 
you know, and they're also doing it in many cities throughout Europe. And I just think that's a very, very important aspect of, of what our politics should be for the future. Yeah, I mean, just to add one little thing, I think that it, we were had a nice discussion about this last night in the line for a sushi place. And, um, <laughs> we can't, we're trying to figure out what actually is the sort of point of difference here. And I think that the key theoretical difference is, I mean, it, I think every, is there's municipalists and, and, and more anarchistic strains is, um, is, for example, Occupy other groups wanted to create popular assemblies and, and, and something like democratic confederalism was the ultimate aim. But uh, even people like Extinction Rebellion are calling for creation of popular assemblies. But the question is, are you going to build those popular assemblies within the existing legal state structure or are you going to try to create one completely outside it? Um, I myself you know, am skeptical about the degree to which institutions which are ultimately part of a structure of centralized violence can really be repurposed. Um, but you know, I mean, if it works, so cool. Um, you know, uh, I'm a, I, I think that, that the key thing is to create a sort of alternative uh, dual power, you know, of something standing completely outside the state structure, which w whose very existence will also push that structure in certain directions. But, you know, I, both, stra it's, a, it's a question of strategy, though. ultimate idea is to build bottom-up structure. Any other comments or questions or ideas? Um, you mentioned taxes earlier. Could you go into a little bit more detail about the tax system as well as any thoughts on the interaction with big businesses in Rogano? Want to talk about that? What the was it? What There's a question on taxes. Taxes, what, yeah, they don't really have any. Uh, taxes. Business, uh, what their relationship is with business. They don't have, a, yeah, it was interesting. In, in, in one of, I remember David Harvey was giving a talk at this conference, which is put, organized by the Kurdish movement in Germany, and say, well, you know, the, the real enemies are the banks. You need to, like, you know, all this talk about, like, different imperial forces and so forth. Yes, that's, I, I, obviously, you can't have, not think about that, but you need to think about finance and the banks as your ultimate enemies. And, you know, to which a lot of my Kurdish friends were sitting there on the back saying, you don't actually have any banks in Rojava. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, obviously banks make decisions that affect Rojava, but it's a little, you know, they're not people that they're directly dealing with. I mean, it's not like there are corporate chains in Rojava. You know, I mean, uh, it's, you know, 7-Eleven does not operate there. McDonald's does not operate there. Um, but neither does Bank of Boston. So, so, so um, DHL now operates there. You can actually send packages. Up. But you know, remember these guys are under embargo, so a corporation couldn't anyway. Um, in the embargo, they allow, you know, so Coca-Cola can't set up a plant there. Coca-Cola does go in, or Pepsi anyway, uh, because they'll allow consumer products to come in through the embargo now. They didn't used to. Um, so that's why you see the shops and that kind of stuff. Um, but you know, stuff that could be used to make it, they won't allow it. So for example, um, you know, there's all those oil derricks. You saw a couple of them, and all these old Texas-style oil derricks you see all over the place. The first time I went there, they were, none of them were moving because, you know, they, they, um, they only were producing for themselves. Now they can export some to other parts of Syria. But, but, but um, the, um, what I was gonna make about the oil. Um, but you know, it's very polluting, and, and there's oil spills, and you know, little puddles around them, and um, there you, people would say, you know, well, we always talk to uh, whoever we're talking to there about that stuff, and say, aren't people upset about the ecological consequences of having all this oil? And, and they're like, yeah, well, you know, I mean, so we'll have any thought about solar. And I said, yeah, you know, you try to like bring in like a solar cell through the blockade. No way they'll let us have that. No way they'll let us have anything you could use to make a solar cell. You know, that, so, so, so they're basically cut off from that stuff. And in a way, it's interesting because there is a certain debate among <coughs> several times I've talked uh, between different factions, some of which say, well, you need to break the embargo because we really need to develop the economy. And other people are saying, well, maybe the embargo is kind of a blessing in disguise in certain ways. I mean, um, you know, it's pretty hard to be front dialysis. Um, a lot of those people died. 
but um, you know, but medical technology does come in. Though. That's one of the things that, that they get can get. Um, but but you know, maybe it's okay that like you know that those corporations can't operate here effectively, and 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 we don't have a lot of those problems. So we've been forced to solve economic problems ourselves in our own way. And also, and one other thing about that is just that, um, you know, I think that part of what's made this revolution successful is that even though there are leaders in a sense, and you know, there's nothing wrong with leaders. There are always some people who are more informed and who have studied more and, you know, who have been sort of absorbed the theoretical foundations. There's something very easy about these people, like you saw the pictures of Sali Muslim and of Ilham Ahmed and, and uh, uh, Fuzi Yosef. There's something sort of, they're, they're taking it a step at a time. And so they haven't confiscated property. You know, they're not saying we're collectivizing everything. They're instead encouraging people to take the, the, to to build what what my father called a moral economy, an economy based on cooperatives in which people get together and they decide. You know, a bunch of people might say we want to start a sewing factory, and they help them. They give them funds to get started, and they teach them skills, and then they encourage them to do that. But there has also been, to a certain extent, some reluctance on the part of some people to move towards cooperative economies, partly because it's, it's different and new, and also because there's this sense of the society under siege. You know, the situation with Turkey is very precarious, and a lot of people are thinking like, oh, if I do this, you know, who's going to be, the, what's going to be the next government? Much of Rojava now, especially in the most north and eastern part, is quite stable, you know, and is very well protected. But other places, like in Mambij, you know, where there was, have been recent suicide bombings, and, and also these areas where Turkey is really threatening now to move in east of the Euphrates River, are really in a precarious position. Another reason why I'm sort of making that pitch for people to really mm -hmm. become involved and try and, and get friends, you know, to call our representatives and to push for the stabilization of the region because it's such an important, I mean, you know, there are a lot of things, as Oslam said, that could be better, that could be done better. It's certainly not the perfect ecological society, although I have to say the people at the internationalist commune and they also can be Googled and they can be supported, mm -hmm. are really trying very hard to bring ecological, they're working on wastewater treatment and all kinds of other, and reforestation. But there's still a sense of precariousness. And again, I think it's something that really you know, warrants our support and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, where we can make a big difference, truly, truly make a big difference. Was there a, somebody else had a hand back there? Yeah. Oh, and then um, I'll, we'll get you next, sorry. How do people say that shared infrastructure or common defense? It's just not that. How do people pay for shared infrastructure or like common defense? Well, why do you have to pay for this? Does everybody like spontaneously do it? I have an idea. I mean, you know, they organize it collectively on the municipal level. Okay. <laughs> So a lot of stuff is organized collectively, but yes, I mean there are salaries are paid for. There, the government does pay salaries. Yeah, the Syrian government still pays the salaries of, of teachers and doctors, actually. And and then Rojava and Rojava, they also have you know income in the form of other sorts of sources in which you know they have, for example, oil refineries where they in, in certain wheat crops or you know they have a kind of a limited economy. Yeah. So it's it actually been very efficient in rebuilding. I mean, like, um, for you know, like in Raqqa, for example, there was all this pledge of money to rebuild Raqqa. It was mainly an Arab city, it was, but it was the capital of ISIS, um, which was largely destroyed, I mean, almost completely destroyed uh, in the battle, um, uh, deliberated. And, you know, and then, like, America pulled the plug on the money and said, yeah, do it yourself. And it's They've been doing it themselves. I mean, it's it's, it's amazingly half, about half cleaned up now, basically using no funds. Right. And and you know, by the way, that's the other thing. I just think it's really important to emphasize this. This is something when I that I saw when I was there. The situation with the number of refugees and the number of hardcore ISIS that came out of Baghouts, you know, the very last ISIS stronghold, 
it's really serious. And, you know, there's been a lot of media yeah. here about, oh, the ISIS wives, you know, <laughs> these poor women, and they were all corrupted. Well, let me tell you, in terms of sort of firsthand experience, these women are rabidly pro-caliphate, rabidly pro-ISIS. And I'm sure more recently there's been more nuance. There's been more, no, I know, because when you, when you talk to them, you see a lot of these women were even more sort of like cruelly engaged in this society in the sense of being more cruel to the Yazidi slaves, bringing them to market, selling them, you know, behaving in ways that were really, like, there, there's, it's not just sort of, oh, these poor victims, these women and their kids. And I, and I think that that's really also important in the sense of what the Kurds really want to do is they want to rehabilitate people. They don't believe in mass incarceration, and they need, to, and they want to do re-education. But the way in which the United States and Europe mm -hmm. has completely turned away from this, both in refusing to take back their own foreign fighters, mm -hmm. and also, you know, think about after World War II, $12 billion for the Marshall Plan. I mean, that would be worth $100 billion in today's dollars. And nobody is talking about helping them. You know, the Kurds have given up basically a certain percentage of a whole generation of young people. You know, 9,000 of their fighters and then another 2,000 Arabs and others are gone off the face of this earth. And many and more, you know, many, many also, not more, but many, many wounded. You know, people who need treatment and deserve treatment from, from the West or from hospitals where they could get treatment. And the fact that, that we've turned our back on them is just inexcusable and really something, again, that I think, you know, our, our so-called leaders should have their feet yeah. held to the fire. Yeah, on. I mean, just to re-emphasize uh, Debbie's point, I mean, in a way, one of the most evil things that's been done to these guys is, you know, they're trying to create this restorative justice system which minimalizes, like, punishment, and, you know, minimalizes, you know, <laughs> appeal to prisons, and, you know, where families agree and kind of consensus on, the, uh, you know, on, on, on restitution instead of uh, punishment, all this sort of thing. And then suddenly these guys say, oh yeah, well, you know, here's 10,000 ISIS war criminals and you got to deal with them. We're not going to do anything with them. So what are they going to do? And they have these guys and, you know, um, you know, they can't exactly just release them all. A lot of the ISIS guys actually, you know, guys who had been ISIS foot soldiers did say, okay, you know, we'll join the FAJ, or they uh, would defect to come over, or even after they were surrendered, they said, okay, we'll join you. And, you know, and some of them made a fair case. They said, well, we're just rural kids. You know, the, uh, these guys seem to be the most kick-ass anti-government guys. We're anti-government, we're anti-government. <laughs> I mean, you know, they had that whole Islamist thing. It was a little extreme, but we're kind of used to that. Um, but, you know, okay, ecological feminists, we can try that. You know? <laughs> um, and, you know, what are you going to do? I'd say, no, go to jail. Um, so, you know, in some cases, uh, you know, if they, don't, if they didn't actually commit horrible war crimes, they're like, okay, we'll give you a, we'll give you a go. Um, but, you know, some of them really are horrible people and, and did terrible things. And, and, and I actually saw a documentary on this. I've never actually been to one of these prisons. You know what they're doing with them? They're teaching them all interior decorating. That's <laughs> 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 a form of rehabilitation. <laughs> Manufacturers are mm -hmm. in this situation mm -hmm. and ways to have more of a direct impact mm -hmm. um, on that, and you know, not just call our congressmen or whatever, mm -hmm. um, because often they don't care, right? And it's well, a lot of energy that's, <laughs> that's wasted. And I mean, I came of age during the anti war movement originally, mm -hmm. um, and these massive uh, anti war organizations um, spent a lot of time like getting hundreds of thousands of people in the streets and then, you know, lobbying and like not a lot of time doing direct action campaigns. And so I just wanted to know, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. what we can do now to immediately impact. Yeah, well in the UK there's definitely people who are identifying the places where these weapons are produced, where they're shipped, what they're used for, 
Um, there's regular direct action of the arms fairs. Arms fairs are held all over the place. And you know, a lot of the, the, the appeal of these arms fairs is that they're, they're publicity dollars. So you know, when people crash them and, and, and reveal, uh, yeah, and they get away with a lot of the stuff these, these people don't know or pretend they don't know what the weapons are actually being used for. So this is actually, a, a, would be a great area for organizing here as well. Um, because a lot of this, um, you know, there's a reason they try to be so secretive about it. They're actually afraid of what would happen if people knew what was really going on. And by the way, you know, again, uh, again, pardon me if I'm making a shameless pitch, but our website, defendrojava.org, which is not up there now, but it's easy to remember, or just you could Google the Emergency Committee for Rojava. We are, and we, and we have postcards out there, and we have a sign-up sheet. We are really looking to expand. We'd really love to have people's help. Uh, certainly, if you can make a financial contribution, that's great, but if you'd like to join our organization, that would be great. One of the things that we're put, making a concerted effort on exactly is that kind of research to do, to do, to find out what would make you know a sustainable long-term effort. Boycotting or you know specific, specific research is one of the things that we're trying to do. And one of the ways that we want to do is by trying to set up some chapters on different college campuses because colleges have students who often are in, you know excited to engage in that kind of research so and but it takes time and it takes money we've all been doing this as volunteers and you know so please do go to defendrojava.org and look there's a lot of resources on there and there's also you know going to be a lot more to come so that's thanks <coughs> is there anybody else who has a comment or Yeah, it's true. It's hard to get a lot of information. I mean, definitely, um, you know, people, LGBT rights are, are part of the whole social agreement. You know, people, they're there. People talk about them. There have been, especially with the internationals that come there, uh, there was a one whole sort of, um, is it a battalion? Do you remember those guys? Um, yeah, that's what she mentioned. Yeah, 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 that's right. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think a lot of some of those issues have been sort of more introduced by the internationals coming in. Do you remember this is like in, in a lot of ways a very very traditional society, um, and they've had to very much downplay issues of sexuality in general, including heterosexual ones. I mean, you know, so for example, while you're in the military, you're supposed to not have se a sexual relations with anybody. I mean, you're always supposed to be in the military for you know, a certain amount of time. Uh, but, um, you know, they have, but even that, you know, this is very different than, say, the Zapatistas or, or a group like that. Um, I mean, there does seem to be a sense that while their hearts are in the right places, they've been not pushing that stuff publicly so as not to, you know, because they have to build these crazy alliances. The tension that they have. Um, is that, on, you know, on the one hand, in order, people are saying, oh, you're just a Kurdish, you know, nationalist group, you need to ally with other groups of other, and, 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 and um, other ideologies, other this and that and the other. Um, and on the other hand, um, you know, so for example, they have to ally with these Arab groups, and they're under huge pressure, even from outside, you know, that they're, being tested by the degree to which they incorporate other communities. But often, you know, they're anti-patriarchal, but that means trying to negotiate with guys who are literally patriarchs, you know, who have five wives and are the head of a, you know, clan, you know, or something like that. Um, and they've tried to 
negotiate that as much as they uh, as well as they can by mm -hmm. sort of putting off some of those issues from a lot of public discussion. But um, I, I haven't heard that there's been a lot of actual repression going on. They just have to find out the court process. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if I may add yeah. just one thing to it, HDP in Turkey, which is oh, yes. ideologically yeah. <laughs> they, they, uh, they cooperate, huge on this sort of they stuff. have been yeah. very publicly pro-LGBTQ alliances, and they've been the only party who have brought up mm -hmm. trans violence and issues against uh, transgendered yeah. people. To the, par to the Turkish parliament. And I have to say that has been at the expense of like mm -hmm. uh, their own constituency in the, south, in the Southeast is mm -hmm. also to some extent religious, but uh, in terms of their official and publicly have been uh, cooperated and sympathized and in mm -hmm. some cases in places like Istanbul and Taksim have been um, pro-LGBTQ activists and have cooperated. So, yeah, I mean, the only so, LG, openly LGBT so people so in the So they've been publicly, yeah, yeah, I mean, they've, they've been the only <laughs> political party who has ever brought trans rights oh, yeah, to I, the... I'm aware of that. I was just wondering, is that now spreading in Georgia? You know, and is it being incorporated okay. into feminist politics? I, I actually asked about that, too, because, you know, I, and, and I, I was saying, you know, when I, much earlier that how what a culture shock it was to go back to Iraq. But obviously, you know, what I didn't say, but what goes without saying, is that there are obviously still certain ingrained, you know, within individual families, within individual mm -hmm. households, um, you know, parts that, that are patriarchal. And, but what I feel, what I've sensed is that the women's movement is so strong there, and they're so committed to education. You know, basically, they go, door to door, which is something I wish we in the left could do here with our neighbors. But anyway, they go door to door and they talk to every woman in every household, in every village. And they invite them to do these sort of education programs. They have two types. One is residential, where you just go in there for several weeks. And then for women who are, you know, have families and kids, it's a, it can be a day program. But, you know, part of the education includes all these sort of anti-hierarchical and also LGBTQ rights. And, and, you know, so they are working in a certain sense sort of, you know, uh, I don't want to say surreptitiously, but I mean, they are doing education and it is very much ideologically part of their beliefs. And, you know, while they may not jump into every Arab household and say, mm -hmm. not only do you have to give up your lives, but you have to be pro-LGBTQ, mm -hmm. it's, the education is really a big part of what's going on there. Right. If you went to the it's university, I think it would be very different than if you, yeah. 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 And, and that, by the way, that just brings me to one more thing I wanted to say is, you know, that one of the things they're desperate for is to have exchanges with us, with people here. And, you know, I don't know if people here how much you know, obviously we're all doing different things, but people at the international commune, you know, they're very anxious for people who have expertise in, uh, you know, basically ecological engineering to be in contact with them and that sort of thing. But also I think that one of the things that would really help strengthen the Rojava revolution in general is more uh, influence and in contact with Western ideas, you know, because they have a lot to rely on in the thousands and thousands of pages of writing mm -hmm. by Abdullah Chalan, but they're also hungry for other, uh, you know, for other materials, the anthropological, very, sociological. Very little stuff exists in Kurdish. They and need very, a lot of translation right, for it. Yeah. Very little does. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. some is in Arabic, but it's hard for them to get it. So again, if you come from a school, if you come, if you're involved in teaching, if you have ideas, please contact us. Let us know. We'd really like to foster that kind of exchange. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And please do sign up. And please do continue <coughs> to come to our events and support and defend Rojava. Thank you so much. Thank you.